What's up, 180? Thanks for joining us tonight. Wherever you are right now, stand up. We're going to go right into some praise and worship tonight. And we're just so glad and thankful that we're able to do this together through this live streaming, through, the, through online. It, is, it means a lot to us that you're with us and, and joining with us. So let's go right into some worship tonight. again we thank you for joining with us tonight if wherever you are lift your hand to heaven we're gonna pray and we're gonna worship our father we love you we praise you we thank you for who you are we thank you for your grace and your mercy we thank you for who you are and what you've done for us but most of all Lord we thank you for your son Jesus we thank you for your presence in this place in every room every car Wherever people are joining us tonight, your presence is there in the midst. And we thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all worship together. Greater is the one 
Amen and amen. Thank you again for being with us tonight. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. So wherever you are, however you're watching, I want you to lift one hand to heaven and let's all pray in agreement that God has something amazing for us tonight. Our Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the wonderful privilege and blessing that it is to be in your presence. Father, I pray that we are all open to 
to you tonight. Father, tonight we lay down any fear, any anger, any depression, loneliness, anxiety, confusion. We give it all to you because your word says that we can cast our cares on you because you care for us. So right now we give you all of those things and we receive your peace your joy, your love, your assurance, and our confidence is in you and in you alone. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much for being with us. What a blessing it is to have church with you tonight. We want you to know that no matter where you are, the presence of of God is with you the same way that he is with us here in this room. God is not bound to a building. Obviously, we love it when we all get to come together, when we all get to hear each other sing. It builds us up. It encourages us. But you can be built up and encouraged wherever you are, knowing that God, your Father, is with you and he is with us. So wherever you are, Thank you again for being here. Where, however you are using your Bible tonight, we talked about it last week. If you have your Bible on your phone, that is amazing. If you have a leather-bound Bible, a hardback Bible, even if you have a picture Bible from whenever you were in kids' church, your parents bought it for you whenever you were a child, it is the Word of God. So what we're going to do is we are going to open it up to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a book that you may not have spent a lot of time in yet, but one day you will. But there's a great verse in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. And it's the verse we're going to use to talk about tithes and offerings tonight. And what it says, it says, remember the Lord your God. He is the one. He is the one who gives you the power. God is the one who gives you the power. Your heavenly father never expects you to be powerful all by yourself. He doesn't say, okay, now you're my son. Now, now you're my daughter. And I did all of that. I made all of that happen. Jesus died on the cross. My Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. And now I've made you my son. I've made you my daughter. So now do this whole Christian thing all on your own. You're by yourself. Good luck. By your own power. God never says that to you. He says this. He says, remember, the Lord your God, he is the one who gives you power to be successful, to get wealth, in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. Really, another way to say this is he gives you the power to get wealth wealth. And he's doing this to prove the agreement that he made with the people a long time ago. It's still in effect today. God never expects you to be powerful on your own. And he gives you the power to get wealth. He gives you the power to increase your finances. He gives you the power to make money. So you always have more than enough. Isn't it awesome that it's not about you? It's not about us. It's not about how strong we are or how smart we are or how entrepreneurial we are or our ideas. It's God's wisdom, God's power in us. He's the one who gives us the power to get wealth. And that's why he says, remember the Lord your God. Remember that after you do, after you become wealthy, after you become successful, remember that it wasn't you. It was never you. It was all God's power on the inside of you. So don't get on the other side of success and say, look at what I did. Look how great I am. I made it happen for myself. No, get on the other side of it and praise God for it. Man, look what God did. I never could have done this on my own. Look what my heavenly father did in my life. Everybody else was falling apart all around me, but my heavenly father loves me so much that he gives me his power to get wealth and he is made me successful. So it was never about me. It's never about us. It's all about God. So whenever we become successful, we can point to him and say, God did it for me. Look what the Lord did for me. And then other people are relationship with God the same way that you do. That's why we need to remember the Lord our God after he makes, makes us successful. And that's why we give. Giving is a form of remembering what God has done in our lives. It's also a way to praise God for what he is going to do. So even if you don't see it right now, even if it hasn't happened yet, that doesn't mean it won't because he is the God who gives you the power to get wealth. So 
Whatever you're gonna give tonight, whatever you are setting aside, like we've been talking about these past two weeks, we're setting our tithe and our offering aside. So whenever we get to meet again, I want you to bring everything that you've set aside for God. I want you to bring it with you to the 180 and we're gonna have the greatest offering that we've ever had because we can't wait to praise God with our tithes and with our offerings. So whatever you're giving, I want you to get it in your right hand. I want you to lift it up to heaven. And let's pray over it and let's thank God that he is giving us the power to get wealth. Let's pray. Our Father, we love you. We thank you that you are our provider. We thank you that we don't have to fear. We don't have to take the pressure of wealth and finances and success on ourselves because you carry that weight for us. You make things happen for us. So we give to you and we praise you as we give and we obey you as we give and we thank you as we give, knowing that when we give to you, you always give back to us 30, 60, and 100 times over because we can never outgive you. We are generous because you are generous. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Like I said, whatever you're giving, set it aside. Bring it to 180 with you whenever we get to meet again. That is going to be such a blessed day. We are so excited for it. But bring it with you, and we are going to have the best offering that we've ever had. Had. So before we get into the lesson tonight, let me just give you some announcements. You are still able to sign up for Camp Elevate. We're going to work out a way where you can sign up online. So there's a, a form you can fill out that's not up yet. It will be. We'll put it out on social media and the website so you can sign up that way because Camp Elevate is still a go. I've had some people ask me, Mark, are we canceling? What are we doing about this? I'll tell you what we're doing is we're living by faith and not by fear. And so in faith, we are believing God in faith that all of this mess, all of this craziness, this fear, this pandemic that's happening in the world, we know that our God is greater than anything that's going on and we are gonna go to camp. We're going to Camp Elevate and we're going to have the best year we've ever had. It's June 22nd through the 26th and we wanna take as many people as possible. So that is still a go. So make sure that whenever we put things out on social media that you pay attention. Pay attention to the Instagram, the Facebook, and Twitter. Follow us on all that so you can stay aware of what is going on because 180 hasn't stopped. Just because we're not meeting in the building right now doesn't mean the ministry has stopped. We're posting stuff on YouTube every day. We're posting on Instagram every day because we long to be with you. We want to connect with you and you need to be encouraged by the word of God. So please pay attention to what's going on there because we are always speaking to you. With that, let's get into the word of God. God tonight. We have got an amazing lesson. I'm so excited to get to teach you tonight. I think that God has really put this on my heart, and I am so pumped to get to talk to you. So let's pray and let's get into this word. Our Father, we love you. We thank you for tonight. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity, the blessing, the privilege that it is to get to learn from your word, that you gave us your word so we could know who you are and we could know who we are because of you, because of your love, because of the finished work of Jesus. I pray that you would speak through me tonight. Make what I say easy to understand. Make it powerful. Make it accurate. And Father, open our ears to hear you and our hearts to be changed by you. And Father, right now, I lift up all of the students all across the Permian Basin. I pray that they would put their faith in you, that they wouldn't pay attention to all of the fear that's in the news. I pray that they would live with wisdom, but I pray that they would live by faith, walk by faith and not by sight. Father, we thank you for the wisdom that you've given all of our community leaders, all of our state and national leaders, that you are continuing to lead them, to guide them by your spirit, showing them exactly what they need to do to guide us through this time. We pray that they would be submitted to you, that their ears are open to hear you, and they are obedient to your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And let me get, there we go. Look at me. There it is. All right. Got it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, tonight 
If you are taking notes, and I hope you are taking notes, take notes on your phone, take notes in a notebook. That's the thing with the lined paper and you write in it with a pen. I don't care if your handwriting is bad. Your handwriting does not have to be amazing in order to take notes. Y'all should see my notebook. It's bad. I have terrible handwriting, but it doesn't matter because God speaks to me during service and I write things down so I can go back to it later and see what God spoke to me. So tonight, if you're taking notes and you want a title for the lesson, it is crossing the line. Have your parents ever told you that you are crossing a line? You're out there thinking, yeah, absolutely. You think that one day that you're grown and so you're gonna tell your mom exactly what you think, like your opinion matters in your house and you pop off, you pop off to your mom and you say exactly what you're thinking and she says, young man, young woman, you're crossing the line. And that's how you know that you just stepped into territory that does not belong to you. You just tried to step into some authority that does not belong to you. They told you to do something. They told you, hey, you need to clean your room. You need to get your homework done. No, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. And you say, you know what? I think I'm gonna do it anyway. And they say, you know what? You're crossing the line. And you know to step back because you just stepped into something that does not belong belong to you, does not belong to you. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. And so with that, I want to start with one of the most famous stories in the entire Bible, the story of David and Goliath, and it's in 1 Samuel chapter 17. So what happens in 1 Samuel 16, we meet David for the first time. And he's this young man, and he's a shepherd. And this guy named Samuel, who is a judge and a prophet from God, anoints David king of Israel. But really what that is, is he's not king yet, but he's going to be. God is telling him, you are going to be the king of Israel. And then in chapter 17, we get to read the story of David and Goliath. But David doesn't show up until a little later in the story. And everybody knows this one. It's a great one. Everybody, not everybody that reads the Bible, almost everybody in the world knows the story of David and Goliath. It's a term that a lot of people use, like when a really bad sports team is playing a really good sports team. It's like, it's a real David and Goliath story tonight. We're going to see how this team does against probably the Patriots. Well, not the Patriots anymore because Tom Brady's gone, but it's going to be funny to watch the Buccaneers win a Super Bowl next year. But it's a real David and Goliath story. Everybody knows the David and Goliath story. So what happens is is these guys called the Philistines, and Goliath is a Philistine. They decide that they are going to go fight the Israelites. Israelites, the Israelites are God's people. They're God's people, and the Philistines are their enemy, and they decide that they're going to go fight the Israelites. And so what they do is they march into Judah. They march into Judah, and they camp in a city called Soko, and they're waiting there, and the Israelites hear that they're there, and then they go camp in the Valley of Allah, and then it says that the Israelites are on one hill, and the Philistines are on the other hill, and then the Philistines send out Goliath. He's their champion. He's their greatest fighter, and we know a lot about Goliath. The Bible tells us a lot about him. He's, seven, he's somewhere between seven and nine feet tall. His breastplate, his armor that covers his chest, weighs around 125 pounds. He's got a spear that they say is like a weaver's beam, really big. They say that the head of the spear, just the head of the spear, just the tip of the spear, weighs 15 pounds. So this guy is strong. He's big. He's strong. All, all, all these attributes about Goliath, saying who the enemy is. And then it says, for 40 days and 40 nights, Goliath walks out and he taunts the Israelites. 40 days in a row, he walks out and he's basically, in your terminology, he's talking trash to the Israelites. He's saying, who is this? Where are, send your champion out. Send them to come fight me. Are you, are you cowards? You don't want to fight me? Are you afraid? Because you know that if I beat you, we're all going to make you our slaves. We're going to turn the entire nation of Israel into slaves of the Philistines. He says, this army of Israel, remember that one, Goliath calls the army the army of Israel. So for 40 days, he walks out and he does this. And the Israelites are scared. They are. They are afraid. 
And so nobody goes out to meet him. They all stand there and they watch him. And then David shows up. David gets sent. He's not even part of the army. David isn't even part of the army, but he gets sent by his father to take his big brothers some food. That's how David ends up at the front lines. And then all the Israelites are talking about this Goliath guy, and David is listening in. And he's, he's young at this point. He's somewhere between 15 and 17 years old. He's young, and he's listening. And the Israelites are saying, man, if somebody could just go out and fight this Goliath guy, the king says that he'll get to marry the king's daughter. He'll never have to pay taxes again. And David's like, whoa, what? I don't know what 15-year-old is paying taxes, but apparently it's something that David is concerned about. And so David hears this, and he says, wait. He, he's like eavesdropping on somebody's conversation. He says, wait, what's going to happen to the guy that kills this, this Goliath guy? Oh, well, he's going to get to marry the king's daughter. And he's like, check, that's the thing I'll do. And he's never going to have to pay taxes again. Double check. That's something else that I'd love not to do is pay taxes. And he says, okay, I'll do it. And his big brothers get mad at him. They get mad. They say, what are you doing here? Why are you, who are you? What, you proud little boy? And David says, what have I done? I'm just making conversation and making plans in his head, thinking, I'm gonna beat this guy. I'm gonna beat this guy, and then I'm gonna marry the king's daughter, and I'm never gonna pay taxes. And so David says, I'll do it. And then he goes to King Saul, who's the king at the time. He says, I'll fight the Philistine. And he says, you can't. Saul says, you can't fight this Philistine, you're just a youth, and he's been a warrior since he was a youth. You're just a little baby teenager. You don't even have facial hair yet. And then this guy has been a warrior since he was your age, and you think you're going to go out and fight this guy? And David says, yeah, yeah, because I fight for the armies of the living God. Look what, look what Goliath said, the armies of Israel. And then David says, no, 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 the armies of the living God. David says, who is this who is this Philistine who has no agreement or covenant with God? He has no promise from God, and he defies the armies. He taunts and talks trash and puts down and insults the army of the living God, but he has no covenant with God. Who is this guy? I'm going to go fight this guy. So Goliath says, it's the army of Israel. David says, no, it's the army of the living God. And so David decides he's going to go fight him, and we know how the story goes. David picks up five stones from the river. He takes his sling. He slings a rock at Goliath's forehead. It sinks into Goliath's forehead and then knocks him down, knocks him out. He walks over to Goliath and with Goliath's own sword cuts off Goliath's head. Because everybody always makes a big deal about how big Goliath is, about how strong Goliath is, about how Goliath runs his mouth. We've just talked about all that stuff. But I think the main detail that we miss about Goliath is right up front in 1 Samuel 17. And it's not about how tall he is. It's not about how strong he is. It's not about how great of a warrior is, warrior he is. It's about where he is. So 1 Samuel 17, 1 says that the Philistines came out and they camped in Soko, which belonged to Judah, which belonged to Judah. So they are in a place that is not in Philistia. That's why they're called Philistines. They're from a country called Philistia. They are in Judah. And who does Judah belong to? Israel. And who does Israel belong to? God. So what is Goliath doing? What are Goliath and all the Philistines doing in Judah? Trespassing. They have no right to be there. The main point about Goliath is not that he is a mighty warrior, not that he's going to kill everybody, not that everybody is scared of him. The main point that we need to see about Goliath is that he is trespassing. He has crossed the line. He is somewhere that he doesn't belong, somewhere where he has no authority, no power, no right to be, but he stepped there anyway, thinking that he and his army were going to take over the people that already live there. However, he didn't expect to run up on a guy like David, who understood who he was, that he was a man in the army of the living God, not just the army of Israel, but the army of the living God. David knew that he had a covenant, had an agreement with God, and that Goliath didn't. So Goliath was trespassing. He was in a place he had no right to be, and nobody in Israel understood it but David, and that's what made David 
powerful. Why are we talking about this? Because this is exactly what the enemy, the devil, tries to do in our lives. He has no right to be where he is, but he trespasses into our lives, seeing if we will give him permission to work. Because the only way the devil can ever work in your life, the only way he can bring fear, depression, sickness, any of that, is he has to trespass into your life first. He has no right to be there. But he comes in anyway. And he does exactly the same thing that Goliath does. Goliath trespasses into Judah. And the awesome thing about the word Judah in the Bible is it means praise. So Goliath trespasses into Judah. He trespasses into praise. The enemy, the devil, trespasses into our praise to try to take things away from us, to try to bring things to us that he has no right to bring. He has no right to bring you sickness. He has no right to bring you disease. He has no right to bring you depression or loneliness or confusion or anxiety or doubt. All of that stuff has no authority in your life until you give it permission by praising it. You're like, Mark, I don't praise those things. Yes, you do. You praise those things whenever that's all you talk about. You praise those things that whenever you lift them up, whenever you make them part of your identity, oh, I'm depressed. And I'm not trying to condemn depressed people now. I'm saying stop praising your depression more than you praise God. Because it says in Psalm 22, 3, it says that God is holy and he is enthroned. It says, yet you are holy, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Or he sits as king upon Israel the praises of Israel, God's people. You make a throne for God in your heart or you put God on the throne of your heart when you praise him as God, when he's not the fourth or fifth or sixth thing down on your priority list, when he is number one and you praise him as God. God, you are, and guys, don't get praise confused with just singing. Because maybe you're out there and you're like, Mark, I love to praise God, but I can't sing. You want to know who else can't sing? This guy. If you've ever stood next to me during praise and worship at service at 180, you're welcome. I don't care if you think I can't sing. I'm making a joyful noise to God, and God thinks it's joyful because I'm praising him, and I'm singing to him, and he is enthroned, or he sits like a king upon my praises, and I prioritize him. I make him number one. I give God permission to work in my life whenever I praise him, when I thank him for everything that he's done. So what the devil wants to do is he wants to come in and steal your praise because you want to know how the devil became the devil because he wasn't always the devil. He used to be an angel called Lucifer, and he was the most glorious angel there was in heaven. He was the praise and worship leader in heaven, so he understands the power of praise. But you know what he said one day? He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm so glorious, and I'm so amazing. I'm going to exalt myself above God. I'm going to take God's throne. And obviously that's not going to work out. And a lot of people like to say there was a battle in heaven. There was no battle. It says that he fell like a lightning bolt from heaven. God didn't just sit there and mess with this guy like, hey, let's wrestle around. He said, no, you no longer have authority here. And he uh, banished him to hell. There was no battle. There was no fight. There was only defeat for Lucifer and a third of the angels because he said, I will exalt myself above God and I'll take God's praises for myself. So since he could not do it in heaven and was defeated by God, since he was defeated by God in heaven, he said, you know what I'll do? If I couldn't do it in heaven, I'll do it in the hearts of every man and woman that God creates. Since I couldn't steal praise in heaven, I'll steal praise in their hearts and I'll trespass in their hearts and I'll take their praise away from God and I'll get them to give it to other things because if I can steal their praise, I can steal the promise of God from them and then they'll never see God work in their life because they've given permission to too many other things in order for those things to work. Uh, They'll give permission to depression. They'll give permission to anxiety and I'll get them hooked on pills and addicted. I'll get them to zone out watching Netflix so they can numb out and just forget their lives and I'll get them to praise all of these other things other than God. And I'll steal their praise that way. And I'll trespass in. I'll step where I don't belong. I'll cross a line. And I'll see if they'll let me stay. And we, whenever we choose to praise anything other than God, 
we make that thing the king of our hearts. We make that thing the Lord of our lives. That is why it says in Psalm 22, 3, that God sits as king upon our praises because when we lift him up, it's not that God isn't king. It's not that he isn't Lord of all creation. It's that when we praise something other than him, we take him off the throne. So when we praise him, we keep him in his proper place on the throne. We thank him for who he is. We thank him for his love. We thank him for everything that he's done. We remember who we are in Christ. The way that David knew that he had an agreement, a covenant with God, we understand that we are sons and daughters of God and all of these things that are coming against us right now, trespassing. Coronavirus, trespassing. Depression, trespassing. Sadness, loneliness, trespassing. Disease, cancer, trespassing. Even, how about this, headaches, trespassing. Stress, trespassing. All of that stuff has no right in your life. You want to know why? Because just like Israel, you belong to God. You are his. You've been bought with a price, and that price was the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was born of a virgin, lived on the earth, died on the cross, went to hell, rose again on the third day so he could buy you out of sin and death and bring you into the family of God. That's why it says in Romans 8 that he is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. He is the firstborn of us. We are the brothers and sisters that that verse is talking about. And we belong to God, but we forget those things when we allow stuff to trespass into our life. So here is your reminder. Stop letting things trespass into your life. Start telling things that they don't have the right. They don't have the right to stay in your life. That you may have stepped in a little bit, but you crossed a line. And now you don't get to stay. Fear, you don't get to stay. I'm sorry. I'm praising God. I'm thanking God. My God is greater than you. My God says that I haven't been given a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Confusion? I don't have confusion because God's word says I have the mind of Christ. I don't have disturbance. I don't have anxiety because Philippians 4, 7 says, don't be worried about anything, but make your prayers and requests known to God. And then the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So I don't have anxiety or depression. I don't struggle to sleep because the Bible says that I will lie down and sleep and I will awake because God take care, takes care of me. I don't worry about these things because I praise God and thank God that he's already handled everything for me. That's why it says in the Psalms, don't worry about anything. The Lord your God will accomplish, perfect, and complete all the things that concern you. You don't have to give permission to anything that God doesn't give you. And you do that by praising God. Praise is resistance. You, whenever you want to resist the devil, praise God. You don't have to talk to him. Talk to God and God will take care of him for you. And so when you're dealing with fear or anxiety or whatever it is that's going on in your life right now, don't sit there and talk about the fear and talk about the anxiety and get in the group text and say, oh man, is anybody else super scared about getting the virus? Anybody else really tired of doing this homeschool thing? No, no, no. You should be encouraging your friends with the word of God the same way you encourage yourself with the word of God. Don't be embarrassed that was the thing about David. David was never embarrassed to praise God in front of other people, and it made him the greatest king that Israel ever had. And so you need to be like David. Remember who you are. Remember that you belong to God, and then never be embarrassed to praise God in front of your friends, knowing that the praising God brings the power of God in your life. It gives God's power access and room to work. Your praise creates room for you. Where the devil is crossing the line and trying to box you in, Praise opens your life up to the power of God. And there's one last verse I want to close down with, and it's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, and it's Colossians 4.2. And it says, pray always. Keep, never stop praying. Be ready for anything by praying and being thankful. Another version says, always pray, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. You know how the devil, one of the ways the devil tries to trespass in your life is he comes into your life and he points out one thing that's going wrong. He points out one little thing that's going wrong. It's like every, there's all these good things that could be happening in your life. All of these amazing things that could be happening in your life. And the devil comes in and he goes, yeah, but remember how you got an F in biology? That's going to ruin your whole life. 
and he tries to convince you that 157 in one class is gonna ruin your whole life for the rest of your life, and he gets you to focus in on that, and he trespasses into your mind by trying to speak to you in a place where he doesn't belong, in a place where he's not supposed to have any authority, and he says, yeah, but what about this one thing? All these other things are going right, but what about this one wrong thing? And so what thankfulness, what praise does is it keeps you aware to who God is in your life. And God is your father, a good father who will always take care of you, always watch over you, always make a way where there is no way. So right now when it seems like there's no way, when it seems like nothing is going right, no, that's not true. You can look at that and see that with your physical eyes and be like, you know what? It's getting really rough. I don't know what I'm going to do. And God says, that's okay. I didn't ask you to know what to do. I ask you to ask me to tell you what to do. You just put your faith in me. You just put your trust in me. I'll handle the situation. Just follow me. So always remember, always remember that when the enemy tries to bring anything into your life, he doesn't have the right. He's trespassing because you belong to God. So when he steps into your life, he just stepped onto holy ground. And he doesn't get to tell you how your life is gonna be because God should be the only one who has the authority to do that. And when you feel unsure, the only thing you need to do is praise. If you can't sing, don't sing. Just say it. God, you are amazing. God, you are awesome. You are making a way where there is no way. Your grace is working in my life. Your mercy is working in my life. Your power is working in my life. I'm not putting my faith in the things I can see. I'm putting my faith in you. And I know that you are going to cause good things to come to me, work in me, and work through me. In Jesus' name, the enemy has to flee when that happens. The enemy has to run away when that happens because you just took all of his authority away from him. All the authority he was trying to steal from you, you took it and you reminded yourself that God has that authority, not the enemy. So whenever something comes up, whether it's this week or next week, remind yourself, devil, you are trespassing. And then I love this one. I tell myself this one all the time. Whenever something tries to condemn me or come against me, I'll even look in the mirror. I'll say, you know what, condemnation? You don't have the right. You don't have the right. Jesus is the only one who has that right. He bought and paid for it when he died on the cross. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we love you. Father, thank you that you are the king of our lives that you are the Lord, that you sit on the throne of our hearts. And we aren't going to give that authority away to anything else by praising that, by glorifying that. We're only gonna praise you. We're only gonna thank you. And you are gonna sit as king upon our praises because we are your people. We're not going to let the enemy trespass into our lives because he was defeated 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again to save us from sin and death. And we thank you that it's not about our power. It's not about our ability or our wisdom. It's all about your power, your ability, your wisdom working in and through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you are out there right now and you're listening and you're saying, Mark, all of this sounds really nice, but I'm not a child of God. I've never asked Jesus to live in my heart. Or if you're out there right now and you're saying, you know, Mark, I was a child of God, or I, may, I thought that I was, and I walked strong for a really long time, and we had a great relationship, but I've walked away from God. Well, now is your opportunity to come back to him. He's never going to shut the door on you. He's always waiting for you to come back to him. So if you uh, identify with either of those two categories, if you are not a Christian, or if you are a Christian, but you feel like you've walked away, I want to pray with you right now. And all you have to do is repeat after me. So pray with me. Say, Father God, I know that I am a sinner, but I know and I believe that your love is greater than my sin, and you proved it when Jesus Christ, your son, died on the cross, went to hell, and rose again. He did that to pay for my sin and open the door for me. Right now, I repent of my sins, and I accept your love and your forgiveness. I am your son, I am your child. You are my father. Make me new from the inside out. In Jesus' name, 
amen and amen. That's the best decision you'll ever make. We always say this at 180. There's nothing you did to earn it, so there's nothing you can do to lose it. Guys, I love you. God is on your side. God is for you. God is working in your life, even if you can't feel it, even if you can't see it. God loves you more than you could ever know. Thank you for being with us tonight. Pay attention to the social media. Pay attention to YouTube. And we'll see you Sunday for Palm Sunday. We've got some awesome stuff in the main service. And we'll see you back here next Wednesday. I love you. God loves you. You're blessed. Good night.